Okay, cool. So, um, glad to be here. Thank you guys for being here with Full Bounce. Um, so, my name is Philippe. I'm from Faction XYZ. Um, we're an AI company working out in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, and we have a strong specialization in uh, natural language understanding and, and everything related to text. So, this panel, actually, because we're in the Dev and AI stage, this panel, I'd like to explore more about the, um, the adv recent advancements in AI, what's happening in the field, um, and hopefully share with you the insights, not only my personal insights, because I have the easy job right now. I just get to ask the questions, the really interesting ones. Now, I'd like to welcome some of the members up on stage. Um, we have, very proud to have Uri, Bhakti, Gregor, Nikolai, and Teddy. Can I get you guys on stage? Okay, so we got another mic going, good. Um, so we have like 35 minutes, you guys, uh, and perhaps I would do injustice if I would introduce you guys. And, uh, we've been in touch the past few days. Um, they're doing amazing work in their fields, and I know they have very different opinions, so this is gonna be pretty awesome. So please, perhaps you can start this way. Um. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, I'm Tedio uh, Zernik. I'm the CTO of uh, VII, a platform, a travel platform company, and we are developing few interesting uh, things in the NLP area. Uh, really, like the hardcore NLP and the machine learning stuff. Fit uh, is at the Berlin University, and uh, hi everyone. I'm Nicola. I'm the CEO of Poly AI. We're uh, relatively young London-based startup. We are very hardcore machine learning. So we're basically a team of currently five ex Cambridge kind of like um, PhD students and postdocs. And we're building, a, not really a chatbot, we, it's, it's a bit controversial. We don't really believe in chatbots that are, you know, text-based. We think to really kind of like unleash the power of chatbots, you need something that's voice-driven, you need perfect language understanding, and we're kind of assembling a thing to do that. So if you're interested in that, just to advocate shamelessly a bit, if you're a great developer, if you're a great machine learner, if you're a great PM, if you're a great salesperson, come find me later, we're hiring. We just raised the seed round from Fashion Capital and Amadeus, and um, yeah, I'd love to tell you more. Hi, my name is Gregor. I'm Jetbot lead from EdTech Foundry, a startup company in Norway. We strongly believe in chatbots and text-based engines, so that's gonna be lovely. I'm looking forward to that. Um, Basically, our tagline is increasing students' engagement and retention. So what we do, we build communication software are for students and teachers to improve communication and use chatbots to foster communication and uh, to allow to remind students and teachers and help them facilitate education. Hi, my name is Uri Lebaev, and I'm the founder of the Machine and Deep Learning Israel community, the biggest community in Israel. And on my daily job, I help companies to use AI in their products, in their companies, to better perform, and that's it. Hey guys, uh, my name is Pratik Gupte. I'm the Director of Engineering at uh, Haptic. So Haptic is a personal assistant uh, in India. It was founded about, about four years ago, and we actually started out with real people. We had about 500 actual assistants replying to chats, uh, and then we realized that this wasn't going to scale out. So that's when we started automating things and we built out our own platform, built chatbot, automate all of this. And now we've gone to almost 98% automation. We've gone from a team of 500 operationally to uh, less than 30. And we've reached up about 20 million users in India. So, and uh, prior to this, I also uh, worked at the uh, founder of a gaming company. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, guys. And, um, so let's start real easy and slow. Um, obviously, we're at the dev and AI stage, so let's uh, address the AI part, right? So, I mean, if I would have to ask you, each one of you, what do you think one of the recent or near future advancements in AI or breakthroughs in AI are that could you know, propel or accelerate some of the developments in terms of chatbots, what would that be? How do you, how do you feel about AI in the chatbot space. Perhaps we can start with you, Pratik. Sure. I mean, I think the, one of the biggest problems we have right now is, you know, the huge amount of dependency on data that we have, especially when building new bots and, uh, you know, everyone has to go in there and kind of build out the manual, the, the flow of the bot, the chat flow of the bot. 
And what that results in is actually the quality of the bot you build is really, really dependent on having a great product manager and having a great developer, uh, you know, and, and that influences the quality of the bot. Um, so I think, you know, to kind of remove that dependency, I think breakthroughs in machine comprehension are going to kind of take us to the next level where we literally just pass on, say, a manual or a handbook uh, and you know we're able to kind of extrapolate questions and answers from that. That's going to make kind of at least mitigate the huge problem of data that we have. So I totally agree with you. Uh, I believe that the the main problem today is, like our friend said, the twelve percent of the bots failed in some point. And to my opinion, is most of the time because of very small problems. If you ask the bot to say come again or if you are talking about uh, some idea or concept that happened two sentences before, so most of the bots doesn't understand the context of what they are talking about. And if a very simple sentence that was a part of a speech with a human, it was much easier to understand because the human can recall to what your purpose. So I believe that the bots will be better understanding of the whole picture of the conversation it will help them become more than just a gimmick. And uh, because if you go to the regular flow, everything is works, but if you go a little bit outside, then the problem start to arrive, and this is what hurt the, the entire experience of the bot. Cool. Um, I would like to take it a bit from a different angle, because um, I think it, you have to distinct what to use the chatbot for. Um, what what type of like for instance for first level support where you have mostly passive uh, chatbots passively waiting for somebody to say something then uh, machine learning and the whole variety of, of possible inputs um, you need to have that because uh, no chance you can prepare it in advance but on the other hand if you have an active chatbot who is sort of uh, starting a conversation you're sort of bringing the context with you and then most of the time you already know exactly how the conversation should be so you design it and that's why I highly disagree that machine learning will help you in any way because first of all you won't have the data and even if you have the data with the state machine you are much better off because you know exactly the step from what it is supposed to take and with machine learning you might have the chance that in the end it says something wrong but you would have known exactly how it should react so I think uh, yes for first level support or for things where you have to this whole variety of inputs machine learning is awesome but most use cases I've seen is actually the chatbot or, or conversation flow a chatbot should have is already known by human beings. So in that case, I would say go for a state machine. Everything else would be a pain in the, in the A. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I would agree uh, with Pratik about the data. And um, that actually getting the right kind of data is very hard. And kind of like if you do language understanding, and everyone has been mentioning kind of like NLU since this morning, and it's actually pretty hard to do and to get the right coverage. And I think people are very frustrated with this. But um, it's not a failure of machine learning models. It's a failure of the data. The models are, I mean, they, with kind of like deep learning, everything's been democratized quite well. And everyone can use the models. And model A to model B, you might get a bit of an increment. But what people are really missing is the data. And then you have kind of like the giants who have the data. But even there, they don't really have the capacity to annotate it. So you know, they hire mountains of linguists who they have to pay quite well. And it's actually not a very scalable process. So the problem is in the data. Now, with the finite state machines, I think people like that because they're easy to get their, to wrap their head around them, right? But actually, if you look at kind of like more traditional dialogue system research and Tom dp based dialogue that uses reinforcement learning, it's exactly avoiding the definition of dialogue states. It's about kind of like using reinforcement learning to actually get a bot that's able to adapt and reason under uncertainty and then, you know, kind of like react and learn to adapt to everything rather than kind of handcrafting the state. But, but it is true that like, you need to give developers a way to access it easily and kind of like, there's almost like too much expectation on machine learning and people think that say, when it's in reinforcement learning that it can fix everything. But as Jan LeCun says, it's like just the cherry on the top and really we have not solved anything leading up to being able to use reinforcement learning effectively. So I guess I've given a very two way answer to it. I actually agree with you about the idea that it's hard to find the good data, but it's very easy to find the bad data. And I can, like, uh, the main argument is the chatbot don't need to, like, be able to be a generic chatbot and answer about stuff. It's not in its very narrow domain. So I disagree with it because 
I accept my bot to be able to, I don't know, tell me what is the weather in New York and be able to tell me what is the Bitcoin USD rate at the moment. And this is two questions that I want each and every one of the bots that I'm speaking with to, to be able to tell me. It's not an application. I don't want to find the right application to answer my answers. I just want to open my device and get the answer. I don't know uh, how it should happen, but I want it right now. So, so this is my wish as a user. Uh, about the machine learning stuff, so this is true. To train a good machine learning model, you need a lot of good data. But to train some specific machine learning on a real time, this is actually, if you ask me, the next step is not to pre-made the model, but to be able to use a small amount of data to make a, a basically fine model to answer a specific question. So this is the next step. Uh, hope like a disagreement, but uh, in a good way. I think if there's one agreement is that uh, we all suffer from the same machine learning fallacy. It's garbage in, garbage out, right? So <laughs> data, data, data. Um, so if we address the dev side of the dev and AI panel now, and of course, um, you know, there are some solutions. You can go off the shelf. You can use open source like Raza NLU, or you can start building your own uh, NLP model. Um, I mean, what would you guys recommend? I mean, this is not a one-shot answer. Uh, there's, there's many factors. There are many elements you have to factor in and, you know, when you take such a decision. So anyone uh, wants to take this question? So I have the mic, I will start. Uh, <laughs> if you are a chatbot uh, startup, you definitely should to, I don't know, to have your own NLP agent, because if you don't have an NLP agent for your own chatbot, so you're not really a chatbot startup. For any other case, I think you need to use something which pre-made and good and have a good result because this is not your main concern. You need to use technology that you have to just yes, to get a good product uh, as fast as you can to the market. Uh, so this is like a straightforward answer. Uh, who wants to continue? Yeah, so, so back to your previous answer, actually, I think that people should use anything to be put on all the platforms because you want one assistant to be able to help you with all the questions. So like my advice would be use anything that the big guys give you but try not to be too dependent on any single one of them because we don't know which one of them is going to emerge as the victor. It's probably going to be Amazon but we'll see. But um, you know if you're then say dependent on Dialogflow, if you're dependent on you know Lewis, you might find yourself in a very very bad situation. So I would kind of like I would not, I mean, building your own LP for what you need, for everything else, shamelessly use whatever's available, because otherwise you're not being fast enough. Okay, again, I would distinguish between who, who you are and what you're aiming for. So um, if you're a corporate and you're just trying, trying to make a proof of concept, then go for off-the-shelf product, click it together, and yeah, show your boss how amazing you are. But on the other hand, if you're a startup, then you might want to use something that actually is not a vendor lock-in. So you might want to go for open source technology. But then again, when you talk to a VC and they ask you, okay, so what's the secret sauce? So what do you have? And then you say, okay, wow, we use this open source. So they'll be like, ah, no, that's not cool. So then obviously you start building your own thing because only if you have your own thing that they can scale and you, have, you can have protected value, then you get the VC money. And all of a sudden, a year later, you don't, you're, you're gone extinct because um, that's not the way to go. So. I believe um, open source is still, yeah, okay, open source is valid. Uh, but I think it's, it's really bad if you're pushed in a certain direction just because you're looking for the money. Um, I think it's very valid to say, I, I think it's a, it's a combination of things and you should try out. But in the end, it doesn't have to be that secret sauce because really in the end it's data and a lot of these systems work very similar. Some are a bit better in this, a bit better in that. Uh, but building your own is, when it's machine learning, building your own in many cases is the wrong choice because there are so many things available where you, that you can take open source and just adapt it and further develop it, save a lot of money and time and, and develop a great product. Um, but as I said, for proof of concept, I think off the shelf is just perfectly fine. Yeah, so I won't repeat, but um, most of you guys uh, spoke about English, for example, and most of us Israelis doesn't have the privilege to use an open source. Uh, and I see it a lot with my customers. If you want to, let's say, build a decent bot in Hebrew, it uh, starts to be very problematic because you don't have uh, either libraries for it. There is a now new initiative to create such a thing in Hebrew. 
but you probably can use the Dialogflow, you can use the Amazon service. So some of time, most of the Israeli companies have to develop their own engine because they have, don't have any other solution. Solution, and, But yes, most of the time, if you have something for the POC, go it. And if you are uh, talking a very small and unspoken language like Hebrew, you need to develop by your own. I think you guys covered most of the points here. Um, I think just one counterpoint I'd make is that if you are building your own, I don't think the motivation for that should be some sort of funding route because in the end you might probably just be using, say, even at the lowest level, TensorFlow or something, which is again um, not really value generating. I mean, the reason you'd want to go and build your own is if you really want that level of control where you want to be able to do something that these other ones don't let you do. Uh, but just, you know, all of these things are so commoditized, this technology is so commoditized now, I don't think building your own things is really going to generate any sort of value which is going to interest any sort of VC company. Yeah, totally agree. It's the level of control actually that, uh, that customers want. You know, that largely defined as well, you know, if you go for roll your own or use a cost of the shop. So, um, coming back to AI, um, and then I'm, I'm looking at Uri and Nicola. <laughs> but um, you guys, I know you guys are working in the field of machine and deep learning as well, I mean, most of us. Um, but um, how do you guys see the, uh, I mean, deep learning has had a profound impact the last few years on also text, mainly computer vision, but also starting to get into text, some applications. Um, like uh, we've seen some words of VEC linked with RNNs that produce some really good results. So I, I was just want, wanting to learn a bit more your insights on, um, you know, trends in, in, in deep learning or transfer and reinforcement learning in the field of text. So, any of you? So I think it? that uh, the main advantage of using deep learning is that we can get rid of most of our statistical and very language-based rules that we used to work in the previous day, because language is very complicated. It's much more complicated than pictures. It's easy to say I see a glass or I see a bottle, but it's much more complicated uh, to understand even a basic sentence. And deep learning helps us to achieve this amazing performance. And not only in this aspect of NLU of understanding, we can see it in a lot of other aspects that we don't even think about it. For example, in voice, the speech to text, text to speech, even the wake up world that we are, we are all so used to in our Alexa or Google Home, it works magnificently thanks to deep learning uh, technologies. So we, we made a little bit the shift for, for taking very uh, smart people who know all the small details of languages, and just bring to the model and say, good luck, and we see very good results. Yeah, I think that's, that's very important. And basically, kind of like if you look at NLP in the last four years, really every other paper you read is about word embeddings. And uh, what's kind of happened there is that NLP has moved away from linguists who move, you know, kind of like linguistic rules and knowledge of specific languages into kind of like mathematical models that just, that are very language agnostic. In a sense, they're very mindless. They don't actually know anything. They're just learning statistical patterns. But this is very good. And then like say, with word vectors, that's kind of like the level of pre-training, the most fundamental level of pre-training in NLP. <laughs> in that when you pre-train word vectors, it, in them you inject notions like semantics, maybe even like lexical entailment, uh, relatedness. And uh, then when you use those word vectors as the building blocks for your machine learning models in whatever application you're doing, so say today we talk about NLU a lot, but in general it can be applied to many things. When you take them there, all your model then needs to do is compose the knowledge that's already captured in the mathematical properties of the vector space you're using. and. Um, the pre-training is there, all the model has to do is kind of like compose it into intermediate representations. So the pre-trained word vectors, we're, we've gotten really far. Pre-trained sentence representations, which would be kind of like the next set, they're not there yet. They're very hard to use for specific applications. And I think we're looking for a kind of a better you know, shift in thinking there to get to a kind of like for developers across the board. Um. So touching on the topic of uh, natural language understanding, let's move into natural language generation, for example, as well. It's a very interesting field, emerging field in, in our industry. And, you know, 
leaping off from a topic like text summarization. You have extraction-based models, but you also have generation-based models. And when we've looked at RNNs, uh, recurring neural nets, we've seen that they do great results on uh, shorter text, longer text become, tend to become incoherent. Um, potentially LSTMs could play a role to improve that a little bit. But the main question is, um, in this emerging field of, of natural language generation, um, how does this impact the chatbot industry? And is it already at a level that we could consider this to be usable? Or, or how do you see this, perhaps, for people? Um. So, you know, text generation is... Text generation is really the key. I think having bots not, again, be less dependent on the content that you push in there. And uh, I think the problem you mentioned of them being represented with long text, I think, that's not really a problem for chatbots because it, the text, again, isn't usually that long. Um, I mean, we ran actually one experiment we did with the text generated model. And the way we used it is which actually with, along with a graph-based model, which was a retrieval-based system. So we had a graph-based model, which was a standard retrieval system. And then so we used um, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with that. So say you were on a particular node and you know the user was trying to divert off topic and you, know, you didn't have all the intents over there, you didn't have everything uh, mapped out, it would then ask the neural uh, model for a response. The, and, but the goal of the neural model in the end is to bring the user back to the main flow. Because otherwise, uh, our intent to become really uh, meandering. So the idea is there to bring him back to the uh, main flow. And um, we saw fairly good uh, results over here. We saw great uh, improvement in automation. One of the caveats, though, is that it was really, really exciting and having already a large set of existing data. So we had about 10 million messages on that domain. We could train on two-way messages. So we were able to deploy it for that particular bot. But we're still trying to figure out how we can you know, take this to newer bots, whether we can really generalize the data there. But uh, we saw some great improvements, especially with text generation with sequence to sequence. But do you feel, of anybody of you, do you feel that natural language generation is already there to be used at, you know? Um, I started developing chatbots 10 years ago and actually the first approach was to generate language because it seems to be um, the thing to do and um, the learning I had back then was um, basically in the end you end up with pretty much the same sentences. So if you're in a certain situation and you want to say something to the user, uh, there might be one, two, three, four, maybe five variation on how you can say it properly and that's about it. And whether you have it just as prepare template sentences in there, or you have a complex generation algorithm that maybe produces the same, uh, same sentences, doesn't really matter in the end. But the problem with generation you have is that it might be from a grammatical point of view, uh, correct sentences, but they might don't make sense, they don't sound natural. Um, so from all the, 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 the algorithms I've seen so far, this area is the least meaningful for using machine learning. I think for when it comes to behavior, like you, you need to observe behavior of users and make sure when to send a message or even NLU stuff and stuff like that. Everything, fine. Machine learning makes sense. But generation, um, especially if you're in a certain domain and you already really know what you, what you conquer with, what you want to tell the user, it, it doesn't make sense. And it's actually um, shifting away the focus from the areas you really should focus on. So this is true. If you want to say something, you have like four or five of the like, right ways to say it. But if you're talking with someone, he actually has a very small number of options to say something. If I congratulate you, you have like, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, you're my name, something like this. So you don't have a lot of options. So this is actually fine. And it gives you a very like, human-like experience when you have like several types of answering per query. So I think actually text generation is very important. But I, the new technology and algorithms is just overwhelming when you're talking about this because actually I'm using a very old style algorithm and work very well. Uh, actually, when I started to develop this kind of technology, I thought about my Hebrew teacher. And my algorithms know how to find part of speech, and I don't. Actually, uh, until this day, I don't know how to find that verb, noun, I, I can do it, but my computer does it very well. So actually, a simple 
uh, rules and like a very not to, to complicate the tree gives you a very good uh, result without thinking even too much. So actually, yeah, it's not the main issue, but it's very nice to have a very important issue and we can just address it with a very simple and classic tools without spending too much time and money about this. So, very nice. Yeah, so, um, I mean, these are, these are really good points. So with generation, actually, that's where machine learning has almost disappointed. So in the corner there is our chief scientist, Sean Wen. Uh, he basically had the first, first kind of like really well-cited LSTM paper in generation. And uh, the paper was a good hit, is the reason why all of us have a lot of citations, but actually, when developing generation, now Sean is insisting we don't use LSTMs. Because, I mean, they are good, they give you grammatical sentences, they give you interesting output, but really in the end, they, it's interesting, but it's not actually what you want. Then uh, another one of our guys, Matt Henderson, he was the lead author of Google Smart Reply. And there what you do effectively is you have 10,000 sentences, or um, don't quote me on that, but um, basically you choose the output out of, out of the sentences you have. And it actually works way, way better. So it's actually counterintuitive that you don't want to go for the blown up machine learning stack here. Makes sense. Um, we keep coming back to the topic of data, right? We need training data. I mean, the data has to be relevant, has to be high quality, all that. So um, if we don't have enough data, and that happens a lot, um, or our customers don't have, you know, data, um, what would you do? I mean, what do you do? What do you recommend, actually, if, if you're being facing such a problem? You don't have enough data to either build your NLP models or train your intents? So how do you go about it? I guess I'll continue to uh, occupy the microphone. Um, so, I mean, actually, when people talk about deep learning, we've kind of been conditioned to think about it as big data. You need big data sets and you need to collect a lot of data, and then people lose faith in applying deep learning to things if they're not one of the giants with a lot of data. But what we found is actually for these small domains, and typically you build chatbots for a specific application, a small amount of very high quality data is actually what you need. So what we use is a Wizard of Oz style collection, data collection framework where we have a chatbot user talking to a person who is actually mimicking a chatbot and pretending to be the system. So it's actually an Oracle system, it always knows what you want. And as it kind of like implements a task, say booking a taxi, you give the guy an interface. And using that interface, he accomplishes the task and implicitly gives you the machine learning labels. And then if you can have something like that to do, I don't know, restaurant booking in Cambridge, it takes 600 dialogues. And that's a lot less than a lot of people think. So that's kind of our take. It's our silver bullet to fighting the, the, the giants, basically. First time, I totally agree with you. Awesome, I love it. So, <laughs> yeah, really, the the practical answer is you put a human being uh, and just have the conversations and let the machine learning algorithms just learn from it and and see how they perform. And over time, you will see, okay, it's getting better, better, better. And at some point, you might start giving the the customer service wherever it is suggestions. So you just need to click and ask the the fast forward way, so you can scale in that way. And at some point, you actually uh, can sort of replace it. Sort of replace it because in, in, in my experience, you will never get the 100%. You, I mean, if you get up to 80% of answering stuff correctly, you already have an awesome system. But realistically, if you like 50, 60%, you're already really good. So in the end, you always sort of need a fallback to a human being or, or some other solution because you never can fully rely on that because you will never get the 100%, not even close. And as I said, I think 80 is the ceiling. If you reach, reach 80, then you're already awesome. So. Interesting. Uh, if you might recall that Facebook launch, uh, they didn't launch, it was a very big uh, publish about uh, bots creating their own language. Do you remember this farce? And the actual what happened is they used guns in order to create, they, had, they were lack of data. And they said, okay, well, what we should do? Even the big Facebook uh, doesn't have all the data and just train a gun model which compete and they will maybe create uh, more and uh, more accurate and big data uh, for them. So you, you can try this uh, trick and maybe it will work, but as guys say here, this is also a solution. Uh, that's it. So we still need humans in the loop, actually, to yes. provide for this data and actually train and label this data, all or not machine assisted. So um, wrapping this session up before we move to the audience, if it has more questions, is. Um, 
how do you actually scale cross language in chatbot? Because language is pretty dead center in this whole field. Uh, you know, we're, we're working in Dutch, and how do you scale this across you know, many, many other languages in an efficient way? Um, so uh, probably there are more approaches, and that might be not the, the machine learning approach, but usually um, the best way is uh, simplification in general. So I mean, like the, the easiest thing if you're staying one language is all type of greetings, like hello and, and good evening and stuff like that. You reduce it to something that still makes sense and you can move on. And uh, this sort of reduction, simplification, however you want to call it, you can actually make cross language because whether it's in one language or the other language, yes, there are examples, but in general it works pretty well. And when you have then the whole rule-based or machine learning approaches, you can work with these simplifications all the way up to the point where you actually uh, respond to the user, where you then have the mapping. So um, the real problem is really the sort of, let's say, the dictionary or the initial library what up in one language and on the other side the output sentences or the generation or whatever it is in the other language. But I think the whole logic, sort of business logic in between could be just one thing if you simplify it to sort of a, a logical language, uh, expression language, whatever you call it, because it's more or less language independent. And yes, there are certain use cases where language matters, where you have certain things that, where you really need to know what language you're dealing with. Um, and then you can start customizing. But in general, with most flows I've seen so far, it works pretty good if you just simplify and reduce it. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's really cool. And that's exactly what you said. Like if you're, say, I mean in education as well, but if you're just ordering a pizza, the fact that you want a pizza is the same in English, it's the same in Hebrew, it's the same in Serbian, right? It's just one intent. Okay, okay, it has to be a kosher pizza, but yeah. Um, no, really, I mean, we are really bullish on machine learning here, and we kind of like create cross-lingual vector spaces. We train models that recognize intents and just say, you know, words are vectors in a cross-lingual vector space, you know, map that to an intermediate representation, make a decision, always train for all languages, and it actually works quite well. And it handles a lot of the things that you used to have to have a linguist specialized for each language. So say if you look at Slavic languages, morphology is unbelievably difficult, right? And you would need a parser for Russian. And someone's done it that, so you can use it. And then you have one for Polish, maybe it exists. When you get to Serbian, no one's built it, you can't build a Serbian system, right? So if you're just training word vectors, you can actually kind of like abstract away from all this. And you know, morphology is solved, for example, if you're doing Far Eastern languages, kind of like Chinese, Mandarin, Korean, then you need to take care of segmentation, and that's also hard. But it's like that you can get rid of a lot of linguists by doing this, and um, they're quite expensive, so it's, it's a good thing to do. I actually agree with you. Uh, this is a very good idea, but it's good to some point because each language contains a, a cultural a idea, a history, it contains something just a little bit more than just the words themselves and the grammatical uh, rules and stuff like this. So this is, will be fine to some point, but when you're trying to speak about politics or I don't know, about uh, about God or something like this, it won't, it won't work very well. You can try it, I try it, it's... Okay, you, ch you should try to ask your, your bot about God, it has a little bit funny answers. My own, <laughs> my has a little bit funny answer, so... It'd be interesting to see what your answer is about this. I mean, we couldn't probably agree on that answer if we started discussing it. So it's, I mean, if we can order pizza well first, that's probably going to be a success for, you know, the next chatbot summit. Okay, pizza. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, we still have a few minutes left. I just wanted to check with the audience if there are any questions um, from the audience that you like to ask our panel members. Thanks. Uh, curious to hear about bot experiences you've built that you're proud of. Good one. Okay. Any takers? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple ones. So first, the one I'm not proud of is first level support because it really sucks the first couple of months until it works correctly. Um, okay, w one is uh, sales advisor. I think if you're in a certain uh, domain area, like for us it was mobile phone advisor, um, and the, the idea basically was to simplify it for people who don't have the technical expertise, so they can say it for what they want to use it for, like going to the mountains, or I need it for the grandmother, whatever, and then you sort of map it to technical things and sort of replace uh, the sales advisor in the shop. So I think that was a very value use case. And another one right now I'm working in is education, 
where I think like kick-starting conversations, so that's like we figured out uh, students love to talk in small groups much more than in the open big groups. So when it's about asking a question or trying to find out something they don't know, it's much easier for them and they are less afraid to do that in a small group rather than a big group. And when you kickstart a conversation with the chatbot, the response is actually much bigger compared to when a human would kickstart this because of the potential of embarrassment. You don't, I mean, they don't realize people are going to read it in the end and the human being is going to read all these conversations, but nonetheless they believe it's a computer and the computer is not going to laugh about them. So I think kickstarting conversations and giving the trust and all the embarrassment out of it is a valid use case and yes, that's some part of it. I've built a, it was a side project, I've built a bot that uses AI both in vision and NLP. You just send a, a photo and then it brings you all the relevant hashtags for Instagram, and people really like it. Uh, some of them thought it's a magic. They didn't uh, know how you can recognize, but it helped a lot of people, and uh, it was really fun. So I think the bots that we build with really specific domains and do really specific tasks that work really well, rather than you know, just broad bots that do everything. So we recently deployed a bot on a, com on a company, it was a pharmaceutical company that basically gives you medical test reports. And you know they had a bunch of calls on this uh, customer support. Hey, when is the report ready? Uh, how much does it cost? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And we just picked out very specific. Hey, we're just gonna do one, two, three, four, five things and nothing more. And I think we did those really well. Where we really gave the status of the report, when's it gonna get delivered? Uh, how much does it cost? Finding those sort of things, right? Uh, I think that was one board that really did its job really well. Ready? Um, so basically, I mean, we spent a lot of time building, say, bots in academic settings. And in those settings, we focus kind of like on building demos for things that are kind of like, fun, you know, more far-reaching and kind of like, say, we mentioned context a lot. So there we would kind of like focus on dialogue state and, you know, having a people talking about, you know, booking a restaurant, right? And, you know, talking about the restaurant, asking questions about it, kind of like very granular, very, very long conversations. But um, these are, these are good in academic settings, but actually scaling something this complex to a real-world domain where users go wild and ask unexpected things. I mean, to the 12% that we saw in that talk would be a wild kind of like understatement to what we, what, we, what we would get if we deployed the system in the real world. So yeah, we might build something in the kitchen. Hey, actually, my favorite chatbot is a chatbot that you give him some subject and he returns you all the chatbot companies and chatbots that it found online that's trying to talk about the subject, uh, which found some of you, actually. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, chatbot, uh, but I like it a lot because it just gives you an idea about a chatbot like a search engine. Think about the chatbot that you search for as a chatbot, like Google chatbot. So this is my favorite uh, gimmick bot. All right, guys, I think our time is up. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on stage. Uh, please give them a warm hand of applause. Pratik, Uri, Gregor, Nicola, and Teddy. <laughs>